Hello and welcome to the first in a series of public lectures hosted by the Carmichael Centre in North Brunswick Street here in the heart of Dublin City. The lectures are being held to celebrate the Centre's 25th birthday and are being recorded by Dublin City FM before a live audience. Today's guest speaker is Sister Stanislaus Kennedy, better known to most as Sister Stan, founder of many organisations including the Combat Poverty Agency, the Immigrant Council of Ireland and of course founder of Focus Ireland, now dealing with Ireland's ever-increasing problem of housing and homelessness. And so to tell us a little more about the Carmichael Centre and to introduce today's guest speaker, please welcome the Chief Executive Officer of the Carmichael Centre, Dermot O'Corbury. Good evening everybody. You're very welcome to Carmichael Centre, to our first in our series of public lecture talks. Carmichael Centre is the first, the largest and the busiest shared facility for -for not-for-profit organisations in Ireland. We're based in two fantastic buildings and our mission is to help social purpose organisations throughout Ireland and we do work all over Ireland and our mission is to help organisations to be more effective and better organised in achieving their missions and their objectives. We do this in a number of ways. The main way we provide an office accommodation, we provide that for support, accounting, payroll, IT, information, training and we'll be very strong on the promotion of good practice, particularly in the area of good governance. We currently have 48 social purpose organisations that will be based out of Carmichael Centre. Each year, these organisations would provide support services to over 40,000 people directly and over 100,000 indirectly in terms of family support. A lot of the organisations are set up by people that have been affected by a particular health condition or a sense of social justice issue. We focus primarily on the small organisations in terms of accommodation because sometimes it's a big challenge for those organisations getting started and getting the support they need. But the big thing for Carmichael Centre is the peer learning that organisations get from talking and working with each other and learning from each other and helping each other, which is a big part of Carmichael Centre. So every day we are committed to delivering services and to build stronger not-for-profits nationwide. So if you're involved in a social purpose organisation, whether it's a board member, a volunteer, a staff member, and you need some help or advice on helping you to be more effective or to deal with certain issues, we're the people to call. This year marks our 25th anniversary, which is a major landmark for an organisation. Statistics in the UK would suggest that 70% of new start-up organisations don't get it to their 10th anniversary. They fail. And I'm sure the statistics are somewhat similar for Ireland, that very few would manage to get past the 10th year. And it is a particular challenge for social purpose organisations to survive. So we wanted to celebrate our 25 years, um, because we've had some ups and downs and challenges over those 25 years. And one of the things we decided we would do was to have a series of these public lectures to mark 25 years. And also we were coming up to the anniversary of the 1916. So it was the theme to have very interesting speakers to give their take on Irish society today and against the backdrop of the sort of the vision of the proclamation of the 1916. We were absolutely delighted by the response we got when we asked people would they be interested in talking. Very quickly we had six great speakers to come on board. They willingly came on board and the voluntary came on board because we wanted to make this a free event as well and we also want to give an opportunity for people that may not come into Carmichael House or wonder what goes on there to come in and see the building, see what what, what happens there and maybe feel welcome to come back and on other occasions um, to see what the different groups are doing. This sort of planning, this process has been Ken, yet some people have known, been working on it for quite a while. But I would also particularly want to thank Dublin City FM. Um, they've been great for helping us to promote this centre and they're here recording this event um, for future broadcast. But it's great to have Dublin City FM supporting this initiative. I also want to thank Torch Base and Sean Mullen is here, who has joined us with us and it's his first time to come into Carmichael Centre as well. Torch Space is a social venture that has been set up to run eating and meeting places in redeveloped areas of Dublin. They have a very strong social purpose mission. They're an excellent neighbour in this local area in Smithfield. When I'd mentioned the Torch Space, we're sponsoring the lovely food and wine here. A lot of people say that the great things that are silently are behind the background that they're involved in helping different groups in the locality. Um, I know there's a few coffee mornings have grown out of meeting in the Torch Space. It's a great facility, great idea, and they've been very successful. <laughs> We're delighted to have Sister Stan, as everybody officially knows her, uh, to be our first speaker in our series. But in addition to having Sister Stan on our panel of speakers, we also wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge and recognise the fantastic contribution that Sister Stan has given 
and continues to give to Irish society. Sister Stan is a visionary and a social innovator in the true sense of those words. She's a member of the Congregation of the Religious Sisters of Charity. For more than 50 years, she has pioneered, campaigned, explored and developed a range of inspiring social innovations to benefit thousands of people that have experienced exclusion in its many forms. For most people, it would be an outstanding lifetime achievement to found one major social purpose organisation that has had a major impact on the lives of so many. But Sister Stan is not someone who stops at making a difference with one important social justice initiative. In the 1960s, Sister Stan was missioned to Kilkenny to work alongside with Bishop Peter Birch in developing Kilkenny Social Services. And the Kilkenny Social Services developed an innovative and comprehensive model of community care that became the blueprint for the rest of Ireland. In 1974, recognising the great work that was being done um, by Sister Stan, the Irish government appointed her to the first chair of the National Committee on Pilot Schemes to Combat Poverty, which led on to the Combat Poverty Agency that many people will remember and um, regret its demise. In 1985, the European Commission appointed Sister Stan as the transnational coordinator in the European Rural Anti-Poverty Programme, working right across Europe. Moving to Dublin in the early 1980s, Sister Stan tackled what was then, and regrettably still is, one of Ireland's most neglected social inequalities, and that's the issue of homelessness. In 1985, Sister Stan established Focus Point, which is now people will be familiar as Focus Ireland, which is the biggest national voluntary organisation helping people to find, create and maintain a home. In 1998, Sister Stan founded the Sanctuary, a mediation centre which is just around the corner from us here in Stanhope Street in the heart of Dublin City. The Sanctuary is a place where people can find a quiet space and time from themselves to explore and develop their inner world, wisdom and find stillness. In 2001, Sister Stan established two other initiatives. The Immigrant Council of Ireland, recognising the change in Ireland, and the Immigrant Council of Ireland is an independent national organisation working to promote the rights of immigrants through information, advocacy and legal aid. And also in 2001, she established the Young Social Innovators, a national showcase providing an opportunity for young people to become involved in social issues and to practice social innovation to help make a fairer and just society. So as you can see, in this sort of short summary of um, Sister Stan's lifetime, she has not only been speaking out about social injustice, she has been doing something about it, and equally she has been encouraging others to do, take action. So we in Carmichael Centre would like to thank Sister Stan and to recognise these fantastic achievements by awarding you with the Carmichael Centre Award for Outstanding Achievement to Society. Thanks very much, Jim. I, I'm glad to be here tonight um, to speak as the, as the first speaker in the, the series of lectures that you're organising to congratulate you on your 25th anniversary. Um, and um, and glad to be here to be associated with the work that you are doing. Obviously, uh, the work, especially the work in, in supporting and housing so many voluntary bodies who are committed to social purposes. Um, and I suppose that's uh, my whole life I've worked in the voluntary sector uh, as a volunteer in, uh, in different ways and um, um, have been associated with many, many voluntary bodies. Uh, and tonight I was, I was going to talk about citizenship because I thought, you, because um, when I read what, you were, what, what your thoughts were with regard to the series of lectures, but then when I heard the budget and uh, I saw what was happening, I said I'd better just stick to what I um, we talk about a lot, and that is housing at this stage, because it is really so it's so important and it's, um, the situation is so really awful. Um, and I mean, just to, I suppose to talk again about um, um, what is wrong and what needs to be done. Um, as we speak here, there are um, hundreds of families bedding down in, 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 in emergency accommodation, over 800 families, and over 1,500 children. Um, and it is appalling. It's something that I would never have thought I'd see um, when I started Focus Ireland 30 years ago. Um, today, there are over 90,000 households 
on, on housing waiting lists. Uh, when I started, there were um, uh, 11,000 households on waiting lists. That was 30 years ago. Um, today there are over 5,000 people who are homeless. There were about 1,000 people homeless when I started. Uh, so the situation has worsened over the years in spite of our good fortunes. In, in, in some of those years, the situation didn't improve. And uh, people are asking today, are asking all the time, why is this so? Why has this happened? And it has happened really because in, in the 90s, there's a tendency to believe that the market would supply all our needs. That was what we were told to believe. The market would supply all our needs. And that philosophy had such a grip on political thinking that they virtually stopped providing social housing. Um, and so we have the situation today where there's been very little social housing provided. Yes, social housing, but that I mean housing that is uh, that people can rent. Housing that's not there to be bought, but to be rented. Uh, 2002, the Celtic Tiger had shifted its base from being based on real growth and wealth to relying on property speculation and construction. And uh, we allowed greedy speculation to dictate our housing policy. That's what happened. And of course, this policy was deeply flawed. And uh, but it drove the boom. That housing policy. So, and our failure to see housing as a social good um, and to see it instead as driving a driving force of the economy. This led to the property boom, uh, which of course uh, was punctured during the crash and caused untold damage. And so, inevitably, house building in the commercial sector stopped, and so too did house building in the social sector. That stopped because the government failed to, had to actually slashed the, any commitment to invest in housing. And this continued after the Celtic Tiger years. And we're seeing the result now with severe housing shortages, severe homelessness right across not only our cities, but our towns as well. And the figures are alarming, but the suffering that is caused is more alarm, alarming. The suffering for individuals, suffering for families, suffering for children. And today we hear a lot from the government. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of talk about what they're going to do. Uh, there's a lot of policies and plans that we hear about. And um, in fairness. They, they, they did announce that they would provide um, 35,000 houses by the year 2020 and of course we welcome that because there's never been a long-term plan with regard to housing in, in, in the recent years. Um, but there are serious gaps in their strategies, very serious gaps. At the moment, about 20% of the population are in the private rented sector and 10% are in social housing. And the government has no policy or no strategy for the private rented sector. And that's a serious gap. Uh, NESC has recently outlined a vision for the for secure occupancy of the private rented sector, but this was not taken up by the government. And so having so many relying on that sector without a robust policy is, of course, fraught with difficulty. And in January, the Minister for the Environment, Alan Kelly, promised rent certainty um, for landlords or for tenants. He promised it again at the budget, um, or before the budget. But nothing has happened. And what we've seen in the meantime is the rise in rents and the catastrophic results of that. And the result is, in terms of families becoming homeless, it's huge. 
because we look the numbers of families, we look at 2013, there were 20 families becoming homeless every month. 2014, there were 40 families becoming homeless every month. Last month, there were 78 families newly homeless. Uh, and in 2012, Focus Ireland uh, warned that family homelessness was at a tipping point, but the government took not no notice of it. And so the numbers of families becoming homeless have increased and increased and increased. And we have, as I said earlier, at this moment, over 1,500 children in bed and breakfast, either in hotel rooms or in bed and breakfast, walking the streets during the day, going back to a room at night, with no facilities for, for, for cooking, no <coughs> facilities for playing. And the, the, there is, uh, they're, they're doing that because of the shortage of social housing and also the shortage of the private rented sector, but even if the private rented sector was there for them, they couldn't afford to pay the rent. So for those families, the outlook is bleak. So the, the second gap in, in this government strategy is that they have no short-term plan. They have the detailed long-term plan of 35,000 houses by the year 2020. And we welcome that. But there are a number of obstacles. One of the challenges at the moment is because the local authorities have scaled down its, its housing operations when they weren't building houses. So that takes a while to, 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 to develop and it needs resources. And there's a lot of squabbling going on between the central government and the local authority at the moment because the local authority aren't delivering as fast as the central government want them to do. The second uh, uh, problem with the short term is that the government is relying very heavily f that the social sector would acquire property from the private sector. This may be unavoidable, but there are real concerns as to whether that property is there or not. And if it's there, if it's there at the price the government is prepared to pay. The third challenge is uh, that there's no clear plan for the next immediate years and this has huge consequences for the poorest. We've heard today about, and we heard it before about the modular houses that are coming, coming on stream. There are some hundred of those houses coming on stream. They're costing a lot. They're a small number and they're very much short term. They will take some families out of hotel rooms and out of bed and breakfast but they're a temporary arrangement. And they're a very expensive temporary arrangement. Of course, we must do everything possible to ensure that people have housed at the moment. And that means, if that means changes in with regard to planning, with regard to building techniques, with regard to financial arrangements, these must be done as long as they're compatible with the long-term objective of providing good quality, affordable housing in sustainable communities. That must be the objective, and we cannot be doing things now that are going to work against that objective. And the fourth concern is, what, are th what is to be done immediately? Because immediately something needs to be done to stop the flow of families becoming homeless. As I said, every week, every day, there's one, two or three families maybe coming into Focus Ireland, newly homeless, who had to leave their home because they couldn't afford to pay their rent. And that's happening all the time. And the government is doing nothing to stop that flow. And the only way they can stop that flow immediately is to increase the rent subsidies. Now, they say if they do that, that the rents will shoot up. But this is a crisis. And something needs to be done at this moment in time to prevent the flow. Because even if they start to house some people, more families are going to flow into this pool of homelessness. So it, it has to be stopped. So that's the, some, something has to be done immediately with regard to that. They also, it's not just rent subsidies, but they all need to look at the whole renting situation and look at the landlord situation and the whole taxation system. Um, and it is as if uh, this dropped out of the sky and never thought it would before. 
no, never, nobody ever thought of it before, but this is a reality in many of the European countries where there is clear rent subsidy and rent regulation, and it works. And there's no reason why it wouldn't work here if they set their minds to it and went about it. Um, but that is a, it's a very serious situation because at this moment, and also there is, the government needs to take a very strong uh, and firm hand with regard to banks and financial institutions because it is very likely that more and more families will, who are in, in, in uh, privately owned property would have to leave that because they're not, not able to pay their mortgage. And there will be an avalanche of, 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 of <coughs> families coming in from that sector. Already Focus Island is meeting families who are coming to inquire about what their entitlements are who are in, 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 in privately owned property. And the others are coming and they're already homeless because the houses have been repossessed. So these are, these are challenges for the governments. There are, there are issues that they're not talking about. They're putting out before us that they're providing these, all these houses by 2020. They're providing these modular houses now. But there are immediate concerns about what are we going to do right now? What are we going to do in the short term while we're waiting for those houses to come on stream? These are fundamental questions for the government. But the final, the other, la, final gap which I'll talk about, which is probably the most fundamental of all, and that is in the government answering the question, what is the ethical basis of our housing policy? If this question isn't answered, we'll repeat the mistakes we made in the past. We'll have the same situation with, with construction, with um, building, with greed, the same kind of problem. If, and we have to answer that question, if our housing policy is to be sustainable and if it is to be promote a socially just society. It must be based on the recognition that housing is a social good, it's a human right and it's not a commodity to be bought and sold, sold in the market. Access to housing is a fundamental right, it's sort of fundamental to survival. It is one of the most fundamental rights. Without it, other rights are meaningless. And it should be placed on the same level as food and clothing. It's as, as much as they are a cornerstone of living a decent life, so is housing. And Focus Ireland has been campaigning uh, for many years to ensure that fa housing was seen as a right. The vision of Focus Ireland from the very beginning, 30 years ago, was that everybody has a right to a place called home. That is its vision today. And we have campaigned uh, uh, over the years that this right would be recognised. And last year, when there was a convention on the, uh, the, on the Constitution, uh, we, we, there was a lot of discussion about getting that right inserted in the Constitution, uh, amongst other social rights. Uh, that didn't happen, but it's important, I think, that it is recognised as a right and that it is inserted in our Constitution. Uh, so looking back and looking forward, I suppose, as we celebrate uh, our um, 100th anniversary of our independence, um, I, it is, we have a lot to be proud of in this country, but we have a lot to be ashamed of too. And I think that we have reason to be ashamed that we have allowed people's basic right, their basic right to housing, to become a currency that's debased. We have to, reason to be ashamed that we played the market with people's basic human right. And that was nothing short of disgraceful and, and indeed indecent. Uh, it's important to remember that we weren't always like that. During the 30s, the 40s, the 50s and the 60s, we provided good quality, affordable housing right across the country. And uh, that was one of the mainstays of the Irish state for decades. When we were much poorer, we did that. And many people um, 
were brought up in those houses and many people, many families bought those houses when they became, when they could purchase them at a later stage. Uh, but we didn't continue to provide them. And to our shame, we didn't continue to provide them when we had so much wealth that we squandered. Uh, but at the same time, I think we in, today, while the situation is really awful, we must look back with pride on those years and really believe that we can do the same now if we have the political will to do it. And that's really what we need. With the political will, we will find the know-how. But if the political will isn't there, and we hear ministers squabbling, like the Minister for, for Finance and the Minister for the Environment, arguing about rent certainty, when families, every more families are becoming homeless. It is really, really not helpful. Not only not helpful, but it is disgraceful. And that really, I think, must spur us all on to really keep on repeating our demand for housing as a right and our demand to ensure that we haven't got people homeless in this country, we haven't got families homeless, we haven't got children sleeping in cars, that we that we want something better for our society. And Irish people do want something better. And Irish people will pay for something better. But we need leadership. That leadership isn't there at the moment. At the moment, I believe that we need uh, uh, the Taoiseach to take it in his hands to lead the whole, this whole situation out of the crisis that we're in. Because as it stands, there isn't, a, well, even, even if a minister with all the goodwill in the world doesn't seem to be able to carry it. Uh, and therefore, we need central, central authority to take it in hands. So that, I suppose, is, is what I want to say to you uh, tonight. Um, and to ask you, and as I know, you're all indeed very involved in this whole social situation, but to make housing a priority and to try to get us to a situation when we really recognise this need as a basic human need and as a basic human right. Thank you. And that concludes the first of the public lecture series from the Carmichael Centre here in Brunswick Street in Dublin. We are very grateful to our first guest speaker, Sister Stanislaus Kennedy. And we'd also like to thank Dermot O'Kirby and Ken Kilbride and all the staff here at the Carmichael Centre for assisting us during our recording. Please join us again for the next lecture where we'll hear from our guest speaker, the former Governor of Mountjoy, John Lonergan. Do join us then, and so from me, Paul Maloney, and all here at the Carmichael Centre. Till next time, goodbye.